In his classic textbook, The Spiritual Life of Children, Robert Coles, professor of psychiatry at Harvard, asked a nine-year-old boy named Tommy to draw a picture of what he thought God looked like. At first, Tommy said that he had no idea what God looked like, so how was he supposed to draw him? Unless God looks like you see him in the windows of the church. Do you want me to copy those? Tommy asked. Professor Coles assured Tommy he could draw his own picture of God, but the little boy persisted. Isn't it a big secret what God looks like? The learned psychiatrist conceded, yes, I think so. And before he could ask the boy another question, Tommy elaborated further. In Sunday school, a nun showed us a picture of Jesus and asked us to copy it. She told us to be very, very careful because it was God we were copying. My friend asked if God and Jesus looked the same. The nun told us they are the same. I wanted to ask some more questions, but I could see she wasn't liking us asking any. She told us to get down to business, and we sure did right away. My dad told me never fight with the nun. <laughs> My mom says they're some of the toughest people on the whole face of the earth. After a brief pause, the nine-year-old was struck with divine inspiration. Maybe God looks like a star. Maybe he looks like a planet. Maybe he's not someone like us. Maybe he's hiding and looks different. I'm sure my mom would agree though, he's tougher than the nuns. With his theology now firmly in place, Tommy began to draw. He drew one large orange circle. And then he drew a face, then he drew one yellow circle. And he drew a face on each of those circles and topped them both off with black hair. Then Tommy picked up a green crayon, then a purple one, then a red one, then a yellow green one. He drew a large rainbow in such a way that it bracketed and sheltered both those faces. Professor Colds noted, the rainbow had an enormous dominating presence on the paper. When he was finished, Tommy proudly showed his drawing to the professor and said, I thought I'd give God the, us God the Father and God the Son. The sun, S-U-N, is the father, and the earth is the S-O-N. The rainbow is the Holy Ghost, maybe. You see, God has a face, and so did Jesus. And then there's the Holy Ghost, and I never figured it had a face. Maybe a ghost does, like those on TV. Ghosts run around, have a face, they talk. But I don't think that's the Holy Spirit is that kind of ghost. No, sir. I'm sure the Holy Ghost must look different, but I don't know how different. <laughs> Professor Coles was astonished. Quote, his vision, the sun as the face of God, the earth as the face of the Son of God, and a rainbow, what we see on earth that owes its existence to the sun as the Holy Ghost was a thing of great and overarching beauty. With all his might, Tommy attempted to draw the great mystery that has perplexed countless generations of churchgoers and theologians alike, the great mystery of the doctrine of the Trinity, God's self-revelation as one God yet three very distinct persons. Now, I'm fairly sure that most of us did not arrive here this morning 
with quite the same excitement and energy we had last Sunday, anxious to celebrate the great joyful feast of Pentecost. Because nowadays we don't really spend all that much time pondering how one plus one plus one can equal one, like scholars and theologians love to do. But that wasn't always true. 1,600 years ago, Gregory of Nyssa, a great church leader, complained that it was impossible to go to the marketplace to buy bread or go to the bank or go to the public baths and not get into a discussion about whether God the Son is equal or lesser than God the Father. It's hard to imagine such a lively debate occurring in ordinary settings in this time. Yet we live in a time and a place with a greater diversity of who people see when they imagine God. And what we also know is in our own Christian diversity, there can be that tendency to elevate or overemphasize one person of the Trinity over the other two. Be it worshiping Jesus over the Godhead or the Spirit, or focusing on spirituality so much and negating words of God or Jesus. Indeed, many of us were taught to image the Trinity as a triangle depicting God, our creator, as supreme, and Jesus in spirit at lesser, as lesser manifestations of God. The union of three separate beings into one is a mystery we can't fully understand and are left only with metaphors to explain it those metaphors we used in our call to worship. Or as John Wesley said, tell me how it is that in this room there are three candles, but only one light. And I will explain to you the mode of divine existence. Such metaphors help us draw a picture of the reality of the triune God revealed in the Bible. We believe that is we trust in God the Father who created the heavens and the earth. We put our trust in that same God who became flesh and dwelt among us in Jesus. And we put our trust in that same God who continues to be present with us and within us through the Holy Spirit. But most importantly to remember today is what this great mystery is meant to reveal to us. Those three persons of God revealed that relatedness is fundamental to who God is. Community is to the essence of who our creator is. And that relatedness is the flowing of divine love. As St. Augustine said, the Trinity is reflected in the relationship between lover, the beloved, and love itself. In other words, the Trinity is a divine love story. And I think the most powerful metaphor for that divine love story comes from an 8th century theologian who used the Greek word perichoresis to describe this union of love within God's being. Because perichoresis literally means to encircle, as in to dance around. God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are like three dancers holding hands, circling together in joyful freedom. Three individuals moving together as one. That is the essence of the deep 
intimacy of love that is between God, Jesus, and spirit, the intimacy of love that flows from them into us and through us into the life of the world. They aren't three independent dancers deciding to come together to dance. They're codependent. They are who they are only in relationship to each other. God, Jesus, Spirit live only in and with through each other, eternally united in mutual love. And the shared expression of that love for a common purpose. And this image also helps us to maintain their distinctiveness, just as it is in the case of line dancing. The movements of each of the individuals contribute to the dance as a whole without losing their individuality. Especially if you watch people like me who are always one step, one clap, one jump behind the rest of the line. But despite those of us who stray, the dance goes on. That God is one, yet three distinct beings means that God values individuals becoming community without the loss of their own personhood. That divine community of mutual love, shared expression of love for a common purpose is to be the model for all human relatedness. And we celebrate today that our faith tells us that that kind of community is possible because of the love of God the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So Matthew reminds us, we who participate in this divine love story hold the tickets for others to come and join us in the dance. Amen.